Hello, it's Duncan Nisbet. I'm here with Keith Klein. Hi, Keith. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Duncan. Cool. Uh, so, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself, Keith, for those people who've been living under a rock for the past 12 months? <laughs> sure. My name is Keith Klein. Uh, I've been working in software testing for about uh, 20 years or so. And right now, I run the uh, Barclays uh, Global Test Center for the Investment Bank and Wealth Management. Uh, before that, I worked with Citigroup for a couple years. Uh, before that, worked for the investment bank and UBS for about uh, six years. And then prior to that, was in a series of consulting and practice-based uh, software testing roles, kind of living and working all over Europe and Asia. Wowzers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your role now is the uh, in the GTC. Yes, the the Global Test Center. Um, so it's about 800 or so folks spread across the UK, India, Singapore, uh, Eastern Europe, and New York. And we do all the functional and non-functional software testing for the investment bank and wealth management. Right, okay. So I, best, I bet that has some of its um, own challenges, does it, being a global global test center? Yeah, it does. You know, there's – there's I'm, I'm – it's a multi-dimensional problem we're trying to solve. You know, you've got just the day-to-day -day software testing challenges that come with project work. Uh, you know, meeting all the requirements of the kind of cost-quality time triangle, and just trying to work out the best way to test software for our projects on a day-to-day -day basis. Then we've got you know highly distributed teams and systems which bring about their own challenges in terms of cross-cultural, different project types, different technologies, um, and just trying to manage those dependencies and integration points uh, is, is a big challenge, and it takes up a fair amount of time. And then there's just the general people challenge of finding good people, scouring the earth all the time, and trying to keep them, you know, uh, retain them, attract them, and develop them. And that's a lot what we've been doing over the last, you know, three, four years is developing a career path for testers at Barclays to make sure we're getting the best people and make, and ensuring that they're trained to with an inch of their life so they can make good decisions. <laughs> and on, on top of all that, I do very much treat running the GTC like a business. Right. So we look at it. At, I have a budget. Um, I have, uh, you know, we we charge to projects in a manner that makes me manage finances in terms of travel and training and expenses and everything else. So we have a cost base we manage to. Um, it's about a 65 million pound budget I run right now. Uh, so with that comes a lot of oversight from finance from risk and control, from HR, from legal, all the other different assets and facets of running uh, a 65 million pound business <laughs> for a bank. Um, and that takes up a, ch a chunk of my time as well. And I'm in the middle of all that, I try as best as I possibly can to be a hands-on manager and get involved in project work without sticking my beak too far in and getting uh, making a mess of things and getting <laughs> getting involved where I shouldn't. So um, yeah, it's fun. You know, it's I would highly recommend it to uh, to to anybody. It's a it's a fun job and and I think particularly at Barclays we've assembled a world class group of people that I get to spend my time with. So I, I definitely consider myself a rather uh, fortunate individual. And you can, you've always got someone to go to for an inspiring conversation. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, you know, that's kind of the problem. I've had, had this, uh, as Pradeep uh, Sandarajan would call it, the tiger cub problem. And, uh, you know, James and I have talked, James Bach and I have talked about this a lot, is you spend time and energy recruiting really smart people and serious critical thinkers and training people in rapid software testing and context-driven testing if you are not prepared for the result of just being challenged nonstop <laughs> and, uh, you know, literally having everything you say questioned, uh, you, you could be in for a rough time. So, yes, I never have to go too far to have someone. Uh, I think it's good because it keeps you on your game. 
And I think, you know, I've been accused of kind of liking a fight anyway, so I, I, I'm quite happy to, to argue um, just for fun. Uh, but I, I, it is, it, uh, it's, you're right. There's never too far to go to uh, have a challenging conversation. Cool, yeah. yeah. I guess the advantage of playing devil's advocate as well, you get people to refine their ideas. Yes, absolutely. And I just, I was, uh, found a great article as somebody blogged about that, I think for Harvard Business Review about being the, uh, who is your, uh, disruptor in chief. So it's really important to find people in an organization who will challenge your ideas because, you know, a lot of particularly large corporations, which is the bulk of my experience, is very easy to get into bubble land where you're surrounded by people who are either sycophants or generally are aligned towards what you want to do and will tell you things that they think you want to hear or to try and help you meet your objectives by that very nature of that aren't giving you objective feedback as best they can. So I think it's really important to find people and and let them challenge you even to just say what I don't, I don't understand what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. You know, what does that mean? And not take it personally. You know, it's 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 really important. And I think to be successful, like crucial to have those folks around you. But it's getting the balance right, isn't it? So, so, yeah, there's the constructive criticism, but not taking it personally. Sometimes people do have a personal vendetta. It always seems a vendetta against you. So it's like, hang on, are you talking to me professionally or are you just personally bashing me? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. And I think, you know, testers particularly struggle with that a bit because it's part of the nature of what we do is to, is critical thinkers to try and break problems down. Yeah. But I, I do find people are so attached to their ideas that they can't function to the level that they should be able to, because when people hear that, they don't like one of their ideas, they translate that instantly into, well, then they don't like me. Yes. Yes. And, and, and then you're, you're so wrapped up in trying to define yourself by how you think, not recognizing that how you think is made up of so many different variables and dependencies that any one of them, which should be changed would probably pop another idea in your head. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, part of it is, you know, the way my parents raised us and uh, my mom was an a English teacher and my dad was a you know, 27 year veteran cop growing up in the south side of Chicago. You know, we just like, you know, ne gave, never really gave each other too much quarter in terms of ideas. You had to like really, you know, be able to be teased and be able to not wrap yourself up in your ideas a whole lot that um, I, I think I, I've never I've never really had a problem letting that go, which which is which has been helpful because where I see a lot of people not being as successful as they can be is being too wrapped up in defining themselves by how they think. Right. OK. And then, yeah, and as you say, you've got the, the, the people surrounding themselves who agree or appear to agree with what they think. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And. You know, this is, you know, uh, the, the talk I just did about the, the testing for confidence. Yeah. And, uh, mentioning Daniel Kahneman, who speaks volumes about it, but people, and even when you do surround yourself with contrarians, trusting them is an issue in and of itself because, you know, we're naturally attracted towards coherence. So stories that, sound like they make sense even if they're complete nonsense yeah. are going to be more believable and then as well if you are treated and thought of as an expert your your own confirmation bias is going to like the coherence in your stories even more so it's going to be doubly hard to try and convince that person that they're wrong <laughs> so yeah it's it's a uh, it's a, it's a nasty problem and requires a lot of diligence and, and, and I, and I even, you know, seek people out. This is one of the things I call the pursuit of scrutiny, right? So seek people out to just don't take anything I'm saying as, for granted and just tear some strips off of my thoughts, right? It's, it's hard to do. You really need to seek it out because it clarifies your, your thought process. Oh yeah, completely. I, um, 
I put a couple of proposals, proposals together for my boss and uh, I sent it over to one of my peers to have a look at it and he's completely ripped it to shreds and uh, even even the underlying concept of why why so one one proposal is to bring RST uh, in house and get the, get James and Michael over and the other proposal is to send some uh, test team members to agile testing days mm-hmm. and he's and he's just gone right okay yeah the proposal these are my thoughts on the proposal rip that apart I was like yeah <laughs> okay good chat but then the, the whole the whole thinking behind it is like why why do I why do I think it's a good idea to get RST in uh, why do I think it's a good idea to send someone to a conference for example and yeah. it's kind of like really fun. and I'm, I'm sitting there again in my head it's obvious it's like well RST, isn't it? It's, it's worth yeah. it. Because- it's really good. And this is, you know, it's super important for, you should be able to answer those questions. If you, and in fact, you know, I, I, I like this, uh, Henry Kissinger analogy where, you know, one of his aides sent him a proposal for something and he just returned it on the, the, the top and said, it was written, is this the best you can do? <laughs> and so the aide went and rewrote the whole thing and worked on it, sent it back to him. He returned it back, written across the top. Is this the best you can do? They went crazy, rewrote the whole thing, turned it in, gave it back to him, and, and he returned it and said, is this the best you can do? <laughs> he came back and stormed into Kissinger's office, said, I this is I can't do anymore. This is the best work I could possibly do. He's like, okay, well, then give me that one. <laughs> you know, so I think if you haven't gone through that process, you know, um, and, I, and I think you're you're selling yourself short and you shouldn't expect people to accept your half baked ideas just via who you are right yeah. so you should you should challenge the experts in there this is one of the things i liked about colin powell's rules for management is you know challenge experts in their backyard right yeah. it's it's okay to challenge people and if you can't answer those questions you haven't thought about it long enough Yes. Yeah. So, what does he mean by in their in their backyard? Sort of like turn up. Oh, sorry. I have a back garden for for the. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like in their home, challenge people in their field of expertise, right? Yeah. You know, if you uh, uh Griffin Jones really last year turned me on to a, a deeper understanding of Richard Feynman and reading his stuff, and and Michael Bolton sent me some interesting stuff to read from him as well, but. Really getting under the, the the skin of that guy, and how how comfortable he was with uncertainty, right? And that you know even the what a, a scientist when he's you know absolutely sure about something, he's still in doubt, right? Which to me is a window to say nothing you know can be truly known, and lots of stuff that we know now because the window of disproving theories is so long it's like fifty years for something for in in the field of science to be thought about critically, so so much of what we know to be true now, where is it in that process? Is it halfway is it a quarter way is it you know yeah. so there's nothing wrong with going at people in their field of expertise because what we were just talking about you know. People, one, are attracted to coherence, and two, experts are believed, you know, sometimes just because they have a lab coat, you know. <laughs> so there's no reason why you shouldn't, you know, question people. Yeah, I guess certainly people who aren't wrapped up in that context so much, looking at it from the outside, mm-hmm. probably have that kind of more objective opinion. Absolutely, and we, the context-driven community is no different. There's lots of things we say and accept as fact that that, that are largely unchallenged as well, you know, and, and I think, you know, the one thing I like about the context driven community is that asking those questions is kind of the premise, right? So it's okay to do that. And we, but, but even there's, there's too much of that, even in our own community, um, where we're not, not challenging ideas. So we, we tend to be very, you know, quick to be critical of other communities or schools of thought. Um, without applying that laser-like focus on some of the things we say and do. <laughs> yes, we have a soft spot for it. Yeah. Oh, it's yes, yes. <laughs> Quality. Yeah. So, well, you mentioned it just then about the Eurostar webinar. Do you want to talk? Yeah, I, it? it's lovely. It's, a, it's just kind of like, oh yeah. And then just the, uh, the, the 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 final kind of closing slice of me just really wrapped it up, and you were like, um, well, we'll get onto that in a minute. But it just it was so succinct. 
Is it, do you want to talk about that for a bit? Yeah, sure. I can talk about it. So, you know, that was kind of an extension of a blog post I had done a couple, two, three months ago of this idea that somehow one of the missions of testing or an objective of testing is to have confidence in either our testing or systems, which it falls into the category of what I would generally refer to as wish thinking, right? Yes. And so this is stuff that sounds like it's true, right? Again, falls into that coherence model. You know, yeah, why wouldn't you, shouldn't you want to have confidence in your systems? You know, <laughs> of course you should want to, you know, and of course we should have confidence in our systems, but make that, that completely alters the whole point of testing to make that your mission. You know, test confidence is a byproduct. It's a feeling that you get subjectively made off of an information set. And if you make that your mission, you're literally intentionally adding confirmation bias into it, which is something we should be on guard against. Yeah. And there's some rather, you know, prominent figures in the industry that I believe market testing in that way, um, that it just keeps popping up. And every time I think it's gone quite, it comes up someplace else. And, and it's amazing through some of the conversations that I've had with people, how many testers even believe that, that, you know, no, I'm, I'm trying to get people confidence because it sounds right, you know, and the, the goal is not to get confidence. It's to get information. And if people feel confident off the back of that, that's great. But if you're going to make that your mission, you know, this is a huge problem. And if you, you know, one of the examples is this curse of Cassandra where you give, you know, unheeded, uh, uh, consistently unheeded warnings, right? That if you're going to consistently say things are okay and then they aren't, yeah. you know, you're, they're going to come right back down on your head and say, Hey, you know, um, you know, this is the QA firewall or the testing firewall mentality. You know, you said it was OK. You yeah. told me I should have confidence. So don't be surprised when they kick your ass when <laughs> something doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Why didn't you find this in test? Mm -hmm. It's really the essence of that mentality. It's the essence of. It. So when you're telling people this is OK to go, you are putting your stamp on it that it's OK. And. You can, you know, they're not mutually exclusive, exclusive, right? You can be a stakeholder in the company as a tester, as an employee, yep. but still not muddy your mission as a tester by providing intentionally unobjective information, right? And that was, that was really the, the, the point of it. And to try and respond a little bit to some of that nonsense you hear out in the industry, you know, that I call it the, the echo chamber of the testing industry. You know, stuff gets, uh, you know, this is the leprechauns of software, right? So, you know, stuff gets said that's unproven, unvalidated, no empirical evidence, but they just kind of bounce around the echo chamber yeah. and start to become true because they're repeated enough, you know? <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, someone just had a yeah, ranty blog post, and before you know it, it's uh, it's fact. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that was... You know, the, the I'm I'm really I'm looking forward to uh, to Eurostar this year. I think Michael's done a great job with uh, the the program there, and there's going to be a lot of interesting people there. But I think more importantly to to our chat is um, you know let's test Australia, which I'm very excited about uh, to, to to go to next year. Of course, yeah. How did you get involved in that? The uh, I can't remember who it was. It, it, exactly who it was? It might have been Anne Marie. But I got a call uh, during the last, let, the last let's test um, when they were putting together the program for the next year and got asked, would you would you want to do a keynote? And honestly, without even thinking about it, I said yes. Um, and for, for me, it's, you know, on multiple fronts, uh, I, one, it's a huge honor to be asked to give a keynote in front of an incredible, uh, you know, dare I say, peer group. Because I, I really think, you know, I was looking at the program last year for Let's Test, and I, you know, I think I tweeted something along the lines of, you know, it's 
the best and brightest minds in software testing all in one place. And I, and there's a lot of really, really intelligent and great software testers all concentrated into one area. So to one, to participate in that and two, to be asked to, uh, give a keynote was to me, in all honesty, a tr- tremendous honor to be kind of, you know, p- thought of somebody who could add to the, the, the dialogue there. Um, and, and, and two, um, it was, uh, I've never been to Australia. So, uh, to, to help, you know, uh, expand the, uh, the let's test universe and as well get a chance to go out there and see the country a little bit was, uh, one of the last places I haven't spent any time. So I was doubly excited to do that. Cool. Yeah. There's a, there's some little voices that are jumping around. When I hear like about the testing in Australia, I just get images of like Dave Greenless just jumping around saying, I'm over here. Don't forget about us. Uh, yeah. Yep. I talked as well for New Zealand. It's like, yeah, yeah, we're over here. Don't forget about us. So for yeah. me, let's get less test over there. It's just really spreading, spreading the community and bringing them under the wing. I think it's lovely. No, I, and I think, you know, if you look at the context driven testing community and the conferences that we attend and the style of confident conferences, and I think, you know, maybe it was you, I can't, I have so many conversations. I think it might have been you I was chatting with about it's important to see how the other half lives a little bit. Yep. Yep. To see how, you know, some of the other big conferences run and how fundamentally different, um, the, 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 the style and method of interacting with people is. And I think, you know, I've always said I view the kind of factory school and very commoditized testing uh, grip on the testing world as very uh, tenuous. I, I One of the things we're not great about, which is one of the ideas I have for the talk, is um, – how we actually communicate the benefits and the approach to context driven testing and a more skilled, the skilled testing in, in, in general. And I think with some, uh, some work and a little bit more, um, coherent and congruent message amongst the communities, you'll see a seismic shift. Um, you know, I mean, would you have thought you know, even a couple of years ago that something like CIO magazine would start talking about context driven testing, you know, yeah. and would accept that as an idea, you know, I mean, and there's, I think even bigger things on the horizon for us. And I think as, you know, we'll talk about Perscalis in a little bit, but yeah. seeing the rapid skill development that the students have had through the context driven training that we've put them through rapid software testing and the way in which we're training them over basically a six week period, um, I think once those stories start getting out and we have a coherent marketing message or at least a messaging around it, because that's one of the, our biggest problems we've had, I think, in context driven testing is that you know, if you look at some of the factory school stuff, they, the common criticism is, well, do you have a viable alternative? <laughs> yeah. Can you afford not to? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think we do. I, I think um, we just because the nature of what we do is so, um, you know, cr- the critical thinking, it, it tends to and, and the, the kind of rugged individualism of all the people in the community. Yeah. You know, people just like they're not joiners. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, you know, it's hard to, you know, it's like that. I say the you know, the Groucho Marx quote, I'd never be part of a club that would have me as a member, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and for years, you know, probably until up until the last four years, I had been actively monitoring the AST and uh, the, the context driven community knew who James was. I talked to him a couple of times at conferences, highly inactive, just not didn't want to participate in stuff. And it's really only been over the last four years or so that uh, I've been active. So I think, you know, there's lots of people like that. We just got to find them and connect them. Yeah. And get them motivated to start speaking out as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, that's one of the things that Let's Test I really enjoyed. Well, I guess it comes from a cast model, isn't it? The uh, the open season at the end of each yes. section. So it allows that critical thinking to come out and people just to say, oh, well, hang on a minute. 
I want to question that, that point. And then again, going back to what we spoke about earlier, the, the person uh, giving the session, it gives them a chance to refine their thinking even further. Again, yeah, just, yeah. You, you leave yourself uh, like, okay, I'm ready for it. I've got 20 minutes of questions. Go for it. Well, and I think that's, it's super important if you go to, you know, it's, it's one, it's a huge difference between allowing for Q and A at the end of a session, which is what typically happens at these conferences and structuring the talk so that the, it's not just if we have time, we'll get to some questions. Yeah. You have to stand up there and, and take questions, right? It's, it's actually part of the time allotment. Yeah. And it's not only that somebody's there moderating <laughs> that. So to cut you off <laughs> and start taking questions from the audience. And, and the, the, the thing where I think what I've seen work needs to be done is that even if you agree with what the person's saying, we need to do a better job uh, because if you, if you look at cast last year, a huge bunch of first timers, right? Even if you're a veteran, you should be questioning people to ask questions that maybe other people aren't ready to ask yet. Okay. And there's, sh there should be, you know, even just for clarifying, because there's a lot of assumption and a lot of confirmation bias baked into the, the community. So, you know, a lot of people are going to say, it around, it's like, yeah, you know, well, we think, you know, aut automation is a tactic, not a strategy. And, you know, and we're all back slapping and feeling good about that. And some people might go like, what, what do you actually mean by that? Do you know what I mean? What, you know, uh, isn't automation one of the objectives? You know what I mean? And, and have that conversation instead of just accepting a lot of stuff that we've heard through our own little echo chamber. And I, I, I think that I'm, I'm looking forward to participating that in a, in a, a, a higher level, which, Interestingly enough, being one of the keynotes for Let's Test Oz, I'm now probably setting myself up to be completely <laughs> grilled when, when I'm there, which is which is fine, which is fine. I I actually like the the discussion part much better than the talk, which is why I I think the Eurostar folks were uh, disappointed. My talk was only I think 28 minutes or something because <laughs> I I uh, I'd rather have a discussion than get up and just talk at people. So. Exactly. Yeah, it becomes a conversation rather than a lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Absolutely. That, yeah. I mean, that's what I was saying in the proposal. This, this guy was like um, saying, "Well, okay, so there's this session. I found a video on this session. Surely that should do." And I was like, "Well, yeah, I've watched that video as well, and that's just got me interested to go to the conference to do the session for real, because then you have the conversation, you get other people's input into it. It just makes the whole experience that much, much that much richer." Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and as well, getting money for your conference dollars, you know, I, I would, you know, I, I tweeted that at the last cast. I said, hey, you know, testers, if you're not taking the opportunity to, to grill these people while you have them in the same room, you're doing it wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah. You should be absolutely grilling these folks while you have the opportunity, because that's that's why you're there, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, and this, the uh, the venue at Let's Test in uh, Sweden. People have commented on this: the fact that you're so remote, everyone stays on site, so you have access. You have access to all the other people, uh, not 24/7, obviously, but um, no one dissipates. No one goes off into the city to go and do some shopping or something. So the conversation yeah. is a lot more richer, apparently, compared to uh, other bigger conferences, I believe. So yeah, yeah I, and and I think that they're built around that. You know, I've been to a lot of the bigger ones, and you know. It's important to go to them to, to you, know, you know, the schools of testing, you know, thought process or the, 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 the I think is, is, is really important to identify, to help people identify different paradigms. But it can also be divisive in a way that's unhelpful when you're not in a school that you like. Right. So you know, it's like I find a lot of the folks who don't like the idea of schools of, of testing are the ones who typically get categorized in the kind of dehumanizing, commoditized factory school, you know, stuff. So then, then that's a useless conversation when we have, I don't like the school you're putting me in. You know what I mean? Um, and then, and then, it, and then it matters, right? You know, other than that, you know, apparently it doesn't matter. Yeah. That's, but, that's a key statement for me. Sorry to interrupt. Like yeah, sure. The school that you've put me in. 
Uh, I remember yeah. watching that debate with Doug Hoffman and James Back, and it's kind of like, uh, do you, do you know, it was on the interwebs a few years ago, and it's like, uh, we've, we've created this, the context driven school, if you like, has created this, this concept of schools, and then we're pigeonholing the other people, and you're like, hang on, I don't want to be in that school. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I think, and, uh, you know, there's, having watched that debate, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Okay, there, ha- having watched that debate, there's two, two parts of it to me. There's one, if you watch that, people are just having an allergic reaction to the idea of schools of thinking, which I just find nonsensical, right? It's like, if at one point, James actually says, is the word schools, is that the problem? We're just because we're saying schools, <laughs> which is the way people have classified paradigms for ages, right? So it's not an unusual thing. There's schools of philosophy. There's schools of science. There's all sorts of different schools. You know, so the idea of schools of thinking is actually very classical in its nature. I think the part of the problem is the way in which it was presented at the time was very divisive. And I get that for the context-driven school wanting to kind of plant a flag yes. and say, look, you know, brilliant marketing for lessons learned in software testing, if that was one of the objectives. But, you know, you know to say, you know, here's here's who we are. Here's our to, to de- delineate, you know, and, and I think is really necessary to say there's stuff here, this whole hyperscripted, very prescriptive approach to software testing is not one testing and two, there's there's other other ways to do it. And and that you you need to do that uh, to try and you know define to show the differences, right? You know, some people are so conciliatory, and I and I and I liked James' talk he did about you know ambassadors and people that need to reach across party lines and things like that. I think the the people who are pushing the kind of factory school model, in my personal opinion are generally marketing people. So they're trying to, or sales folks, trying to move a product. Yeah. And so if you look at your big, who are, who are the ones doing it, right? It's either big system integrators that are pushing that stuff, you know, the big, big vendors that have, you know, 15,000 testers, 20,000 testers, you know, to meet that kind of volume, they have to, you know, that, that's how you, the, the whole mindset behind commoditization you can define what one means and then we can stamp it and put it in a manufacturing model and just keep churning out you know widgets right so to meet the demand of crappy requirements for crappy testing that people (laughs) you know tried to outsource that and say you know i don't understand the problem which is rule one of something you should never outsource i don't understand it so let's give it to somebody else to do right (laughs) And two, it's labor arbitrage, right? So they're just trying to do it somewhere cheaper. Yeah. And then three, it's a process they don't understand about what good testing actually looks like. So you've got, you know, dyed in the wool opportunists and marketing people who go, hey, you know what? Yeah, I, it costs you, you know, X amount to do it in New York. I can add three people to the problem and still do it for half the price from Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. And, and that's created some really, really bad behavior. My personal experience from dealing with a lot of these folks and the people who sell that stuff is that if their view, and I've had this conversation with senior folks at the at, at a lot of these companies, is that now I would ask them, why do you sell me this crap? Right? You come in here and you tell me the stuff I know is not true. And you try and put a nice little button and ribbon on it and give me a dashboard when you know I know that's not true. Their response typically is, hey, if you guys would stop buying it, I would stop selling it. All uh, right, yeah. Vicious circle. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. So I think, and I've, that's one area where I've really tried to reach out to and say, hey, look, let's, there's a better way and more business value focused way to test, you know? So, um, I, you know, I, I, I think it's, you know, there's the whole certification debate and, you know, the relative value of that, which, you know, I think is just 
intellectual laziness on a lot of people's part that they don't directly translate the harm that does to the industry to them. And this is, I think we were talking about earlier is that you and I both make less money because of that crap. Right. (laughs) And, And if people put that together and said, Hey, you know what? I don't have as many opportunities or I make less money because people think my job can be done by trained monkeys. Um, you know, Hey, that actually hurts me in the pocketbook, you know? And, and as James and Michael both said that, you know, they, they don't like, they want bad testing to die too. Right. Yeah. So nobody's afraid of, you know, test is dead. Yeah. We want bad testing to die too, because everyone else has better opportunities and makes more money and has better careers. But those groups have a right now a deeply seated vested interest in perpetuating that model. So with your with your work with the, the GTC at Barclays, uh, and obviously you see you got the global the global company. Have you uh, had any kind of interesting challenges around uh, conversing those countries that typically had a commoditized kind of testing mindset into this? I like, know testing's a thinking game. You're not a commodity. You're not fungible. Have you come across any kind of uh, interesting challenges where those the, 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 the testers typically typically in that country are? No, just give me some requirements and I'll I'll tick a box. Yeah, yeah, I, no. So I mean, speaking specifically about um, India for us, and it's been an interesting kind of petri dish. So so we started most of our context driven rapid software testing training in Singapore, okay. which interestingly enough, the makeup of a lot of the test population in Singapore is actually Indian nationals who live abroad, and in a different context than being in India. They took to it like a duck to water, right? Okay. And even when James came out and did the initial training, he was like, oh, my God, where did you find these people? These are not the folks I thought we were going to have. And we've been doing a lot of prepping and work with that. When we started the training in India proper and working primarily in Pune, we already had some good case studies for that. But I think the – reluctance to question me and the approach they would say oh yeah you're right we're going to start you know uh doing session-based test management let's do the training and exploratory testing so, without going hey i i want you guys to push back against that too right i want you to <laughs> so then you get to some level of ownership that you feel like it's been through your thought process and then you're like okay you know yeah in this context et does work right and this is where we should be be using it and so we just kind of shifted from Everybody was really excited, you know, senior manager coming out, doing some training, famous tester James coming out and doing some training. And so we just shifted from everybody who was just doing metric scorecards and was gung-ho for that to, you know, it was like the five-year-old soccer match, right? So we were chasing the ball this way. We just changed it. Now everyone's chasing the ball that way. And it, it kind of had a little bit, you know, we, we had a great, you know, leap of interest. And then it dr- dropped considerably. Because people are going, hey, wait a minute, he's serious. I have to actually think. I have to say, I have to actually apply myself. And you know, one of the things I made one of our partners do is um, from their investment fund is buy everybody in the two hundred. I made them buy two hundred copies of lessons learned in software testing <laughs> and give give everybody a copy because I said I want to see it on your desk and then I'm going to go to your desk and I ask if you started reading it. So we actually developed a mandatory reading list for people and put it into their objectives. Oh, really? certain, cert, yeah, certain white papers and books we wanted people to read, and the, their test managers were required to make sure that they had read it to their confidence. So that's interesting. You know, yeah, you start doing that, and what's well, the great thing about running a benign dictatorship, right? You can, <laughs> yeah. you, they, to a certain extent, they, you know, you have a lot of latitude to, you know, make people. Uh, comply to your whims, right? But, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but you know, then it took off, and now it's nuts what's going on out there. I, they've started their own working groups. They've started their own testing and focus groups. They do their own ET workshops. This is like, so from that initial, you know, enthusiasm to try and just make the boss happy, to then kind of a dip of, wait a minute, you know, this is actually a, a lot of work. Yeah. Um, to now a real sense of ownership. 
And some of our best work is coming out of India right now. It's it's uh, amazing some of the things that they're doing around visual test strategies, oh, cool. um, around heuristic based test strategies, and and it's there's a lot of value being added there. Um, but it was it was you know probably took the better part of a year and a half to get there. <laughs> so so there is some value in kind of driving learning into people. So I'm, I'll take an approach in a moment. I'm doing like uh, brown bags or lunch and learn sessions. Mm -hmm. to video so people don't have to commit too much to it and i want to build that up to like workshops and sessions and things like that but i'd rather than forcing people it's just like say well i'm watching these videos anyway i'm going to book a meeting room and you're welcome to join me do you did you find that forcing people or not forcing the right word so here you go here's lessons learned in software testing read it uh did that did that approach work well it sounds like it worked for you yeah it, it does for some and not so much for other the thing is is that and this, whereas I think people, one of the one of the bits around where there's n senior test managers are are few and far between, is that you know ultimately I'm running a medium sized business for for Barclays, and at the end of the day when it hits the fan, they're gonna ring me, right? <laughs> yeah. And that responsibility means sometimes I'm gonna make. It's this ain't a democracy, right? And you know, yes, I want to take everyone's view in, and I know, and I know the the NVC people will be all over me for that. But at the end, at the end of the day, you know, sometimes decisions got to get made, and and if I truly believe that what we're going to do is for the betterment of them, even though they may not know it yeah. or realize it yet, or going to help us test better for a company, which is you know ultimately the goal. Because a lot of people have an assumption that their job is some kind of entitlement and not you know, not a privilege that is funded and can be taken away at some point. So being respectful of that, you know, I, if I genuinely think taking a heuristic based test strategy as opposed to writing a 30 page document yeah. is a better use of our time and I've got su sufficient management backing for that. I'm just going to make people do it. Yeah, of course. That's why and, you're it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and that's, that's, you know, one, that's how a, a, a lot of advances get done. Um, and, and, and now we're three years into it and, and that becomes the norm, right? Um, and, and, and actually I've heard of a few of the folks that, although we have psychotically low attrition in the GTC, a few folks that I know have left and joined other firms are starting to, you know, implement user groups and they're, they're using mind maps and all other stuff. So, you know, it's, uh, you, it's, it's not a bad thing. Um, I think so. And sometimes you have to make a call on it because ultimately somebody's going to say to me, Keith, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> and I'm going to have to explain myself and what we're doing. And that I don't, I don't have a problem making those judgments because, at the end of the day, if you're being thoughtful and critical and not to attach your ideas, guess what? You can change your mind. And we were doing it this way. We make small adjustments, you know, um, but but some some things have to be done a certain way. So I guess if you weren't investing in like heuristic test strategy, you'd be you'd be investing in a, another factory school method per, per se. Yeah. Or, so it's, the money's got to go somewhere. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think. You know, I tell the folks that because interestingly, an interesting reaction that we had when we first started deploying the context driven testing approach at Barclays was some of the testers kicked back and their objection was, hey, you know, this is great while we're here. But if I go somewhere else, how am I going to work in a factory school environment? How am I going to do other things? How am I, you know, I'm going to get trained in this stuff. Yeah. And, you, you know, it does this make me commercially viable, which is a completely legitimate concern and question to raise. And I tell them when that gets brought up is you regardless of where you work, if you follow the techniques that we're going to teach you and the test approach that we're going to employ here, you can always go back to sleep. Right. <laughs> it, yeah. And you'll still test circles around those people. Right. And in some ways, you'll be a much better tester in that environment than they would be. Um, but you can always, you know, take the blue pill and go right back. You hook back into the matrix if you want to. 
Um, but I don't think you will. I, I think when you'll have a difficult time checking out once you truly get it. And, you know, we, you know, one of the things that we did was we had, when I joined, we had 15 level, or no, I'm sorry, five, um, was it eight, seven or eight, seven or eight levels of test, uh, uh, description. So we had, <laughs> or, or rank. So we had test analyst, test lead, test engineer, test senior test manager, test manager, uh, you know, t- it, was, it was like, it was seven or eight things. And, and I said, look, we're going to get rid of all that. And we're going to have three levels, right? A test analyst, a test manager, and a senior test manager. And that, and people went, oh, you're going to, everyone's going to quit. You know, you need to be able to promote these people. And, and, you know, that first year we had, I think, you know, a 4% attrition rate because I said, look, we're going to pay you to market. Yeah. But I don't want you focused on your rank, you know? Well, so we've got people with 15 years experience who are, their title is test analyst. And my view is, What's wrong with that, right? Who cares what your title is? Are you doing good, great work? Are you in an environment that's allowing you to use your skills and you can learn and fail and fail safely? Are you doing challenging work, right? You know, I think those are the things that are important. And, and, and you know, leading from the front in that is is important to kind of set the tone. But I think a lot of this stuff all falls into that the the the, the myths of managing people that they they care about that they care about money they you read anything about it people don't care that they care about being able to have a living wage beyond that most people don't really care that much about it they want to do challenging work in a healthy environment I I I, I do know an example of uh, <laughs> some guy who's actually into his title and he's a uh, He's, he wants this lead, this lead title, and the money goes with it, and he's not happy that he's not getting it. But you know, I, I think that that person won't be happy anywhere. No. You know, what I mean? because they're, you're defining your happiness on external things that are completely arbitrary. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. So, so um. This... Oh, you weren't talking about yourself, were you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I am that guy that has, I've been testing for 12 years and I'm still a tester. So yeah, the title doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> I know, uh, I, I, I'd mentally checked out of testing, uh, before I moved into like the, the, the kind of agile role and then did the RST. And that just reinvigorated the testing for me straight away. It's just like uh, the, the thought of writing another test specification or, uh, test plan or, uh, Blooming test cases in Excel just yeah. made me feel so nauseous. I was just thinking, I need, to, I need to change careers. I was looking at like, right, okay, do I make the stepping stone into a developer like everyone else does at the time? And it's just like, no. And then it's just like, right, uh, all oh, right, wow, testing can be different. And then it's like, so then, then it was an, uh, it was an XP team. So I was like, I've been recruited and you're telling me that I'm not needed. We don't need testers. Oh, really? Right. Okay. And then it's just like, and then from day one, you start finding, you start finding or adding value by, uh, dispelling their illusions, as James Back says. And they're like, oh, right. Yeah. There is value in a manual tester. Right. Okay. And then I did the RST and just got more and more efficient. And then, yeah. and then just like being able to add value from day one and your, and for your opinion to be heard and to be recognized, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. it's just immense. It's just like, right. This is what testing is all about. And so the roles I do under that title were more important than the title itself. Yeah. And people are get so focused. The things you're talking about there are like really Michael Bolton would refer to as test framing and and uh, you know reporting or telling the testing story. And those aren't technical skills and those aren't, um, you know, they're they're context dependent, but they're things that like are so important and really critical to being a good tester. And all that other stuff focus you on just like functional decomposition of systems and writing test cases. And, the, and what RST, I think, really helps you figure out is like, what is the testing problem? Right. And and how do we articulate that to people? And how do I think about how I'm thinking about things? And that's that's why I like it so much is that it reframes the whole problem and, and focuses you on adding value instantly. Because I, I, I use this example all the time that. You know, if I'm talking to our CIO, you know, and he and he asks me, you know, Keith, I want to know the last critical defect that was found and what the potential impact would have been to our business. And I say, well, the test pass ratio was 89 percent. You know, what I mean, 
he's not going to, yeah, I'll never talk to the guy again. You know, <laughs> you need to be able to articulate risks to business. Cause that's what they, that's what they care about. And under that's RST helps you frame that and context driven testing help gives you skills in order to provide that value, which you said you can instantly start doing. That's the great thing about it is that the, the, as soon as you get back to your desk, you can start doing things differently. Yeah. And it, I think you touched on it there, but we spoke about it earlier as well. The relationship, everything in software is relationship because there's people using the software. It's, uh, and on the BBST as well, it talks about like, uh, the house is a, uh, is just a load of bricks and mortar, uh, built into a waterproof shape, but actually a house is for someone to live in. And mm-hmm. so, so you start thinking about testing his relationship to the people that are going to be using the software and you're like, ah, right. Okay. And then that just gives it a whole new spin on it. Yeah. Yeah. It instantly reframes the whole problem for you and you start thinking differently about it. Yeah. You know, but, but if you go into it with the mind frame of, you know, this is going to help me, um, you know, write better test steps. You know, I mean, you, can, you know, you, 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 that may be a ancillary benefit potentially, but you know, that, that's not what it's about. So you're doing it wrong. Yes, you're doing it wrong. Yes. <laughs> so, so with all the training with uh, the GTC, was that a mm-hmm. kind of trial run for what you've done at Perscolis? So do you want to talk a bit about the step, the uh, software testing education program Perscolis? Yeah, so that's you know become a bit of a, uh, a, a a passion of mine and some a few folks as well. And I think, you know, although being involved in the initial stages of it and some planning has really uh, taken on a life of its own. And and honestly, I said this at uh, at Cast this year uh, when we were talking about it uh, on the last day, Paul, Paul Holland and I. You know, people should be incredibly proud of the community that we're in and the way people, just like yourself, you know, have pitched in and helping people and, and they're, they're amazing folks anyway. And, and the whole thing, uh, really got, got started when, uh, my CIO at the time, who's, who's still on their, the Perscalis board, um, we were talking about nonprofits and training during our regular meeting. And he said, Hey, you know, you should go out. And meet with the Perscalis folks and do, uh, you can go out there and give an industry talk and just give some context to, you know, where, how you got your job, what you did and what you do and, and, and give people just kind of a, like a learning through leadership session. And so I went out there and did that and got completely grilled for probably an hour and a half, which was fantastic. You know, they had been reading you know, Barclays, uh, you know, reports and, you know, read my blog, you know, and watched videos of talks I'd given and were just giving me excellent questions. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I mean, it, with a, with the right training and, you know, an opportunity, I'd hire half the people in this room, you know, if that's their approach to task, you know. Cool. So yeah. what was that? I was going to say, who, who would they? When you say uh, to them. These were students at Perscalis who were attending the 15 week training. So every student who goes to Perscalis does a 15 week uh, intensive basic technology boot camp. Plus, um, there's uh, life skills, office skills, you know, professional development that goes along that over the 15 weeks. Right. Um, so it's a it's a really intense uh, training period to start off. Then, um, when we started up the, the step training, they get, uh, they have to, uh, it, uh, be, be pre-selected and then, and then, uh, basically handpicked to be on the step course. Um, and then they go through, uh, two days of this, the introduction to software testing that I, I teach at Barclays and then spend a day on a client site actually working alongside real software testers to see what their day is like. Mm-hmm. Then they, then they start three days of RST and then do a week of RTI. Uh, Paul Holland is the principal trainer for that, but it's the same, uh, courses that are available commercially. Yep. And as well, some stuff added in from what we teach at Barclays. And then they do four weeks of U test sandboxes. I was going to say it was previously during the first two weeks, uh, QA Symphony and Smart Bear have very generously given um, software to, to the folks so they can actually get 
some experience using commercial grade automation tools and yeah. uh, you know, test planning and case management tools. And then they do four weeks of uh, U-Test sandboxes, um, which is actually working on real projects from the Perscalis lab. So um, the first cohort is just uh, about wrapping up. So we haven't even finished the, uh, the, the pilot course yet. And I've had lots of interest in people going on interviews. And I think one of the, the – so people like, you know, James and Michael and Paul Holland – uh, you know, Lorinda Brandon from Smart Bear, um, you know, Fumi from, uh, U-Test, uh, uh, Josh and Vu from QA Symphony, uh, the AST is giving them a year free subscription or, or membership to the, to the AST. Uh, there's, there's, there's all sorts of fantastic folks who have pitched in. Aside from companies like LiquidNet with Anna Roisman, who's done site visits and done lectures there on agile testing. Yeah. Uh, there's been all sorts of fantastic people helping out. Um, but I think one of the greatest things about it is that we've started up this mentor program where we pair up a student with a seasoned uh, testing professional from all over the planet. Um, in fact, very few of them are actually in the U S to give the, when these people start, they, real jobs, they've got an outside work relationships with somebody to ask questions that they might not want to ask on the job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and just give them some advice and form relationships. And I think the, the greatest thing about it is kind of taking a, a bit of a leap of faith on, on these folks. And I had a, an epic long conversation with Michael Bolton one night about, you know, was this all going to work? And we were both pretty convinced that it would is the feedback we're getting from people about how awesome the actual students are. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Yeah. 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 So, so the, the whole, the whole thing's been fantastic. We've got another cohort starting in November. Um, we've got some relationships we're building with a couple vendors on, on uh, getting these folks some, some jobs because, you know, the, the goal was never to put them through six weeks of training and then, you know, submit them to, you know, uh, job serve or monster <laughs> or yeah that they're, they're, they're never going to swim in that sea so we need to form a relationship with some folks to give them the opportunity to show what they can do and we've had people interview with all sorts of companies already we had one of the testers um do an epic three-hour interview with google in new york oh wow and Oh yeah, and got through it, and unfortunately they they wouldn't get past their requirement that people have to develop, so they told her to go to Code Academy and learn some Java and then come back. Um, but she started drawing up. They said, "Well, here, show us how you would test this." So she started drawing up a uh, product coverage map and using uh, a heuristic test strategy model. And they stopped there, and they're like, "All the people we've interviewed, no one has done that. Where did you learn how to do this?" <laughs> Yeah. That's, yeah. For for me as well, the the fact right, you you offer the mentor scheme as well is awesome. It's not like okay, you've done your course, kick you out the door, good luck, thanks for coming. The mentor yeah. scheme just keeps that little hook in, doesn't it? It's just like they they're not they're not alone. They're kind of there. There is someone there if they need to. Yep. And I think it's it, it won the incredible response because no one's paid for anything, right? It's all volunteer, and the the unbelievable outpouring of response from folks. I mean, we have a waiting list to be on the mentor program, which oh, is cool. amazing as well. But I think, you know, it's really shows the strength of the community. And once this gets into high gear and we start, you know, placing some folks and a cohort has been placed and everything else, I, I truly believe in that, you know, everyone laughs at me. I, I think it's going to be a big game changer for how, People, testing roles are sourced and people are trained. I, I think there's a real viable commercial model here to say we can take folks from all sorts of walks of life and do, we could do project work. You could do all you could do all sorts of stuff with this. Yeah. And I and I think it'll be that will be part of the counterbalance to the 40 question multiple choice <laughs> test that somehow certifies a competency. We, we, we're producing people with, you know, little to no testing experience who are getting interviews with Google and, and being grilled for three hours. 
Um, and, and I, and I think that's a fundamental difference. No one who took that other certification would, would get through that, you know? Yes. I mean, and that, that's a classic as well. It's like, uh, the foot in the door, isn't it? Must have ISTQB. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, and, I, and that's why I think that that foothold is so tenuous that just with the right push and, and a very viable alternative, that stuff will just, it'll either have to fundamentally change so much. It won't be commercially viable anymore because they, they're not structured to offer comprehensive training. You know, even the advanced and expert courses are just exams, yeah. right? And the training is still a week. And even though they have years of experience requirements, it will fold like, you know, some of the other schemes that have been developed like that. You know, we're talking people that part of the training is, it's six weeks of training, by the way, and it's, you know, they do RST, they do RTI, and then they use those skills directly under the guidance of the UTES folks and, and James, Paul, and Michael. And they get direct feedback and coaching from those folks on how to test and then use the skills directly on projects. You know, that's that's fundamentally different, yeah. you know. Uh, than, than coming in and saying, look, you know, she could sit down and draw a p- product cover match because she'd done it multiple times through that training. And yeah. I think that the, the part one, because it's all um, nonprofit. So to, to, to enter for scholars is free, right? You apply to get in and, you know, if you meet their criteria, it's free. The, none of these people have paid for any of this stuff. So that completely takes the floor out of paying for training and mm-hmm. and paying for an exam, right? So you can imagine, can't you? In a few years' time, uh, must have step <laughs> as, yeah. a, as a, a kind of a, a requirement. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that would be a fantastic, <laughs> you know, outcome if that was uh, if that was part of it. But I think, you know, there's there's lots of other you know I, ideas around this, and you know. For me, it was really the the idea of it was not born out of altruism. It was born out of a a commercial proposition. Say, I have I struggle finding good testers all over the planet. Yeah. Here's an opportunity to develop a training course um, and and a program and a whole community building effort to really meet my own very selfish needs. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's one thing I'm having at the moment. So part of the workshops I run. include some of the RST material. But what I'm really concerned about is that the, the message gets diluted. Do you know what I mean? So it's obviously when it's coming from James or it's coming from Mike or it's coming from Paul, they're, they're the first hand, they're the kind of the primary, uh, not what are called, the primary the primary instructors, aren't they? So they, they've got it and it's great and it, it comes from them, you get their energy. When I find I'm doing it with other people, Although I try and do the same energy, I'm still dissipating it because I'm a secondary instructor. Yeah, yeah. Well, it takes to deliver those courses takes special people. You need to have a depth and breadth of experience to one give you the credibility to help people to do different things. Yeah. But two to answer lots of different questions. So, you know, if you're talking about a skill based training you need to actually have the skills to do it. Um, so there, there's not loads of those people walking the planet. But I, I also think, having seen some of the RST stuff developed, because we've been intensely using it over the last three years, I, I think some of the work that Paul, James, and Michael are doing right now, in my kind of four-ish years of working with them, is the it's gotten tremendously better it's some of the best stuff they've ever done i think the the it, it kind of dropped off the radar screen but the testing checking um paper should should really be a proper paper they that that's some of the most um advanced and different thinking about software testing um that i've seen in a long time and the, the work they're doing right now i think is some of the best work that i've i might have ever seen in in testing i really mean that it, yeah. it's it's incredible stuff and the materials that they've produced and the exercises and is, and pushing the Perscalis, um, turning RTI into a kind of five day commercial model, um, that can scale has forced a discipline on some of the materials that 
has just turned it into something really great. I really, I really mean that. Yeah, that's cool. That's it. I, I really hope it comes off. I want to get the RST on the rock. That's how I'm, that's how I'm selling it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Yeah, like just going back to Pascalis, I'm speaking to one of the students, and uh, I'm just so jealous. So he's, so he's got, all, <laughs> got all this kind of intensive training behind him. It's just like, wow, if, if I had done RST, I would just I would just be nauseous. So luckily, yeah. we can talk about RST. That's fine. And you go, okay, what are you up to tonight? He goes, oh, I'm going to a, I'm going to a meetup over in so-and-so. And then, oh, what are you doing tomorrow? Oh, there's another meetup. And basically, he's just he's just having a wild time at the moment, just going to all the geeky meetups that I've just yep. done. And I'm like, oh, dear. And I kept, so he was at BDD Exchange last week. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, oh, yeah, I'm not jealous. Well, they were able to swing um, swing 10 tickets to the BDD Exchange. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So they they got uh, Perscalis got ten tickets, and and that's the that's the thing that I think has been missing is that the the kind of private part private public partnership around that to you know because Perscalis looks at their gig as a business, right? They want to make sure the folks that they have a high place rate for like the last I think they've been in business twenty years. It, it's it's over like eighty five percent that they find people jobs and they stick in those jobs. So think about getting through 15 weeks of intense technology, corporate life skills training for 15 weeks. You know, it's, it's a, it's the people who make that through that are highly motivated. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and so the folks that come out are very, very good. And there's access and, um, resources available through that kind of private public partnership. That if you were just going to do it on your own, like if I was just going to do something like this for Barclays as, as, you know, great as Barclays can be at times on this stuff, I'd still have to compete against all the other, you know, I'd have to find, find training budget for somebody. You know, I'd have to, to yeah. you know, there's all that kind of stuff that comes with it, the bureaucracy that comes around just pursuing it from a private perspective. And if you just did it from a public perspective, then, where are they going to get the money from? You know what I mean? So to, to combine them together has been a really interesting um, relationship. I was just at a, a, a mini conference on this. JP Morgan hosted uh, um, a, a company called Year Up, which is uh, does um, uh, internships for disadvantaged folks uh, in all sorts of neighborhoods to, to work with companies. And Perscalis was there, and we were talking about the step training and stuff. This is really becoming a huge thing, finding alternative sources for skilled labor um, outside of just kind of traditionally trying to hire yourself or go through third parties, the outsourcing or systems integrators and things like that. And there, you know, aside from the social good part to it, the people are awesome. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, uh, What's next? What's next for Step? You've got another uh, call coming in November. Have you, are you making any changes to the course? No, there's not. Other than some mild alterations, um, we'd have no no changes for the course for the second one. We'll take some feedback from the folks about what worked, what didn't work with the with the uh, the training, and then the the, the U test uh, sandboxes. Um, but for the most part, we're we're on course to deliver similar ish uh, training for the second one. Um, you know, next step is really to, uh, you know, get, get people into some work and, uh, d- finished off some of the, the partnerships that we've got to get the folks hired and get the next, uh, cohort started, um, and, and continue on from there, get another round of mentors, uh, lined up and just keep it going. And, you know, I, I think there's, you know, I've got other grand ideas about how you could build, um, and I like to call it an urban development center, but instead of doing things offshore, develop project work from a captive in the Bronx. Um, and, and so there's some, there's some commercial models I've been, if you look at something like the city of New York has tons, millions of dollars in tech funds that could offset transition costs for moving work back from other countries yeah. into yeah. urban areas. And, uh, if you look at, um, I know there's similar programs that, Focus on this uh, in the UK, where the Department of Works and Pensions, uh, you know, sells contracts to different cities to give them money to help 
people find jobs and get off you know, long term unemployed, or people get off the dole. Um, if you paired that up with training, and I've been talking to a company in Ireland that's that's done this right now in a small scale, um, there's there's opportunities to take this thing internationally as well. I, I've been approached by three countries um, to get their hands on the training and how and to see how it goes. So a lot of people are watching how this how this pans out because the, there's there's folks all over the place who have the same problems that they that that we're trying to solve. So. Fingers crossed, you know, we have, it's wildly successful and, uh, we, uh, we start, start putting people into work. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take it, uh, probably across the U.S. next and then look at, uh, you know, what the, what, how it could be rolled out globally. Gotcha. Okay. So I guess the proof is in the pudding. I mean, the, the energy sounds great from the, the first cohort. So let's just see how they get into work, right? As with everything. <laughs> the proof, <laughs> and actually, I, if I if I can correct you, I think the proof is in the eating. <laughs> that, that's probably a good note to end on, Duncan. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Pete. Thanks ever so much for your time, mate. Yeah, it was great talking to you, man. Real appreciate. It. We should do this again. Definitely, definitely. It's good to get some inspiring chat on the go again. Okay, man. Okay, man. I'll catch you later, Keith. Thanks again. I'll speak soon. Cheers. Bye, bye. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Bye.